If you've ever been hangry, you know it's no fun to be low on fuel. Every organism needs energy to live, but not every form of energy can be used by living things. The candy bar you ate to cure your hanger goes on quite the journey to be transformed into a form of energy that your body can actually use. Organism cells are constantly going through a process called cellular respiration, which converts the energy that's stored in sugar molecules into usable energy that can fuel all the other chemical reactions of life. That usable energy is namely in the form of a molecule called adenosine triphosphate, or ATP for short. The chemical equation of cellular respiration is C6H12O6 plus 6O2 yields 6CO2 plus 6H2O plus energy. In other words, glucose and oxygen gas go in, and carbon dioxide gas, water, and ATP come out. Since this is, you know, the metabolic process that keeps us all alive, scientists have dedicated a lot of time, and ATP, to figure out how it works. Today we're going to recreate some of their early investigations and measure cellular respiration in the lab. Then I'll leave you to go off and design your own experiments that ask fundamental questions about what variables affect the rate of respiration. First, we need a tool that can measure respiration, aka a respirometer. And we're going to build it ourselves using this syringe. It's also known as a micro-respirometer because it can only measure respiration in teeny tiny organisms that can fit inside. Our respirometer design uses some clever chemistry so that changes in oxygen gas volume can serve as an indirect measurement of respiration rate. Normally, as organisms breathe in and out, they produce one molecule of carbon dioxide gas for every molecule of oxygen gas they consume. Since we're using the rate of oxygen consumption as an indicator of cellular respiration, we have to make sure that the other gas, carbon dioxide, doesn't mess up our results and influence the gas volume in the respirometer. Rude. So we're going to add potassium hydroxide to our respirometers. It'll react with and eliminate the carbon dioxide to form a solid called potassium carbonate. This means that as cellular respiration proceeds, the gas volume in the microrespirometer will decrease because oxygen gas is being consumed without being replaced by carbon dioxide gas. That volume decrease is what we'll be measuring. You'll want to make enough respirometers to test each variable in your experiment as well as your control, so be sure to finalize your experimental design before beginning. I'll only need to make two respirometers today, one to test the respiration rate of germinating seeds and the other for my control. We'll need one milliliter plastic syringes without needles, thin stem plastic pipettes, 40 microliter capillary tubes, a hot glue gun, absorbent and non-absorbent cotton, a solution of 15% potassium hydroxide, a few quarter inch flat washers, manometer fluid, which is just soapy water with red food coloring, centimeter rulers, tape, and markers that can read on glass, a water bath and a thermometer, the organism you want to study, in this case germinating radish seeds. Germinating means I've soaked them in water for about 24 hours, so they're just starting to sprout. You could also use little critters like worms, ants, or flies, or play around with different types of seeds and plants. Finally, you'll need glass beads for the control respirometer. First, while I warm up my glue gun, I'll make sure the plungers of my syringes are pushed all the way in. Then I'll insert a capillary tube into the syringe where the needle usually goes, making sure it slides all the way to the plunger tip. Next, I'll seal the place where the capillary tube meets the syringe with hot glue, keeping the capillary tube sticking straight up until it cools. I'll know I did it right if I can pull back on the plunger. If not, the glue plugged the capillary tube and I'll need to remove everything and try again. Once I'm sure my capillary tubes are fine, I'm going to draw up the manometer fluid all the way into the tube and eject it, which coats the inside of the tube in a thin film. This is gonna come in handy later. Now I need to add potassium hydroxide to my respirometer. From this point on, I'll be wearing safety goggles and gloves as well as my lab coat because potassium hydroxide is super caustic. First, I'll pack absorbent cotton into the syringe up to the 0.05 mil mark using the tip of a clean pipette. 
Next, I'll add a drop of potassium hydroxide to the absorbent cotton, being extra careful not to touch the sides of the respirometer with my pipette because I'll be spreading a nasty chemical all over the place that could harm my organisms once they go inside. Right on top of that, I'll add a plug of non-absorbent cotton. It can absorb liquids, so it'll act as a physical barrier that protects my organisms from the caustic potassium hydroxide. Then I'll ever so carefully reinsert the plunger of the syringe. I'm reinserting the plunger over a beaker because there might be a little drop of potassium hydroxide that comes out of the capillary, and we do not want that squirting all over the place. Okay, the time has come to add our little organisms. I'll remove the plunger and add 0.5 mils of germinating seeds to my first syringe, then reinsert the plunger to the one mil mark. We now have a sealed respirometer chamber with a volume of one mil. I'll repeat this process with my control respirometer using glass beads instead of a living organism. Lastly, I'm going to place a couple washers around the barrel of my respirometer for added weight. You'll see why in a minute. And then I'll tape a ruler to the capillary tube so that we can keep track of how far our fluid moves. It is critical to the experiment that our respirometers maintain a constant temperature. The best way to do that is with a water bath. Mine is at the temperature of the room I'm in, about 24 degrees Celsius. I'm going to lower my respirometers in so that the chamber is submerged, but the capillary tubes are sticking out. You can prop them on a sling made out of tape if that's helpful, and the weight of the washers will keep the ends submerged. The respirometer should be airtight so that water and additional oxygen can't leak in. After waiting five minutes for the temperature to equalize, it's time to start measuring the change in gas volume in our syringes. I'll do this by adding a drop of manometer fluid to the tips of the capillary tubes and marking the location of its bottom edge on the tube. As the organisms respire and the gas volume decreases in the syringe, the fluid will get sucked further down the tube. The food coloring will make the position of the fluid easy to see. Easy visualization is so important in science, and sometimes it's as easy as adding a little food coloring. On each syringe, I'll mark the position of the fluid every five minutes, for 25 minutes in total, and record the temperature of the water at each time point. Once the experiment is complete, I'll enter my measurements into data tables, one for each syringe. In the first column are my time points, starting at zero minutes, my initial measurement, and going in increments of five up to 25 minutes. My temperature readings go into the second column, and then the actual measurement of how much the fluid moved in the capillary tube will go in the third column. I'll use my ruler to find the lengths of my markings from the starting point at time zero. Finally, in the fourth column, I'll calculate the change in fluid position during a given time interval by subtracting the previous time's total distance from the current time's total distance. If there were any changes in temperature or pressure during the experiment, they would have affected the position of the fluid in the control respirometer. From my control data, I can see that the position remained steady in the control, so I'm all good. If it hadn't, I'd subtract the length that the fluid moved in my control data from the lengths in my experimental data. Once I've made any necessary adjustments to my data tables, I can calculate an average respiration rate from the values in the fourth column and divide that average by five to get the mean change in fluid position per minute. My results indicate that my germinating seeds are respiring at a rate of 0.09 centimeters per minute. Great job, seeds! Well, I only measured respiration in one type of organism in one environmental condition. Now that you're armed with the technical know-how to build your own respirometer, it's time to go off and form your own hypotheses about what might affect the rate of cellular respiration and design an awesome experiment to test them. What gets you the most curious as an investigator? Is it the life stage or type of organism, or maybe something about the environment they're respiring in? If all that planning makes you hangry, you can always have a snack to give yourself something to respire.